I always tell people, if they ask me, how do you, how do you become good at something? Well, find a role model and copy them. And if you do that, you'll eventually find your own style and your own contribution. This is where it all begins, so say goodbye to all your fears, all your doubts. This is where they die. This is where we come to win, we come to fly. This is where we make our dreams come to life. Welcome to Innovation City. Welcome to Innovation City, a podcast featuring the innovators, disruptors, and creators who are making things happen today. My name is Michael T. Johnson. I'm here with my co-host, Tyler Kelly. And tonight we are in St. Louis at the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center at 39 North. So we're very excited to be, to be here today. And also, we have the president of the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center with, with us today, Jim Carrington. Jim, it's a pleasure having you on with us today. Yeah, it's nice to be here. Thanks for being on the show. There's a lot of activity here, a lot of excitement that's happening here at 39 North. And so for everybody that's listening in, I want to tell you just a little bit about Dr. Jim Carrington. Uh, of course, you're the president of the Donald Danforth, Danforth Plant Science Center, and you lead the center in de- delivering on its mission, which is to improve the human condition through plant science. You're also one of the most highly ci- cited plant scientists in the entire world. Wow. Yeah. And uh, you've been recognized for your research on gene silencing, small RNA, and virus host interactions. And you were elected as a member of the National Academy of Science in 2008. And you have a very long list of awards. I don't need to read through them all. I think, no, I think that people get the point, right? Uh, it's a pleasure to have you on the show, Jim. Thanks oh, for nice joining us. to be us. here. I appreciate the invitation. Yeah, so first off, we're here at the Plant Science Center, so tell us what actually happens here. Well, this is a nonprofit research organization of about 265 employees, about 175 of those being scientists, and we do research to figure out how plants work, and then we figure out ways to apply that knowledge to do something useful in the world, whether it's Uh, develop a more nutritious crop or develop a technology to make farming more sustainable, use less water, for example. So has has this sort of thing always been, obviously it's a career of yours, but has it been an interest of yours and where did all that start? Well, you know, I'm not sure how far back to go, but I've always been interested in science, and by that I mean I liked science in school. Uh, really, the maybe a better question is how did I get into the research end of science? Uh, because that's kind of a specialized niche in the whole STEM world, and that was completely by accident. I needed a job when I was a sophomore in college, didn't have one. I moved out of the dorm, and I needed to pay the rent and couldn't find a job. Applied at a pizza place, and I got a call. They said they wanted to hire me, so I drove my car in, sat in the parking lot for about an hour, debating myself whether I wanted to go and work in the food service industry, which I really didn't, and eventually just drove away, hoping something else would come up. And the next day, I got a call from the plant science department at the University of California, Riverside, where I was an undergraduate, asking if I was still looking for a job and would I like to wash dishes in a laboratory, Wow! beakers, test tubes, and the like. Dot, dot, dot. And it's a case of, you know, you don't, you don't find your opportunities. They kind of find you. Once you're in that environment, you start sniffing around and asking, what are all these people doing? And they let me join in in the scientific research, and that's really how it started for me. Wow. So what's the most interesting thing about research or about, like, figuring out how things work? Well, I think you actually said it right there. Okay. It's it's, if you're interested in how things are put together or how things work, Uh, Science is great because science is a system that allows you to figure that out. If you like to be the owner of a piece of information that nobody else knows, 
uh, science is great because you can discover things and there's something about learning something for the first time and having this kind of power that it's just you and you know if you believe in God just you and God know eventually you tell other people and that's also what's exciting about science you can help illuminate how the world works so take me back to the first time that happened for you the first time you discovered something that you knew in that moment you were the only human on earth to discover that well uh, my earliest experience as an undergraduate again was uh, the guy I ended up working with Professor Dawson gave me a new virus in a plant he gave me a sick plant and said figure out what this virus is somebody brought this in I don't know what the virus is but it looks like it could be interesting the plants had these funny symptoms on it and so learned how to purify viruses and things like that and I was totally confident this was something new and different but in the end it turned out to be as common of a virus as the common cold is and so did I actually learn something new certainly nothing dramatic but that's actually kind of how science works most of the progress forward are little steps and occasionally there's a big step and that's where you um, that's where you like to be when you make those big discoveries but I got to say, most of what being a scientist is, is, is a slog. And it takes a lot of patience, it takes a lot of time. Uh, but if you put the time and the patience and the, the effort in, you can learn some pretty spectacular things. So I'm, I'm curious as you, like in those early days and starting career, your career, did you have an influence or somebody you looked up to or somebody that inspired you? What was it that inspired you to, to take the path? Into? Well, I think the, the scientists in the lab that I met for the first time were really the first inspiration. Now, was it because they told me something fundamentally important? I don't think so. I think what was most important was these people looked like they were really engaged, having a good time. They told a lot of jokes. They were funny. They were smart, they were fun to hang around with in and out of the lab. I think it's, I'm describing finding your niche. And so I think collectively, the graduate students and the, the other scientists in the laboratory, they were the early inspirations and they were the ones that took me in the, under their wing and taught me how to do things. You figure out eventually what you're, what you're comfortable, what you're excited doing, and then you kind of find your, you, you craft your own way. That's why I always tell people, if they ask me, how do you, how do you become good at something? Well, find a role model, or stumble upon a role model, or a set of role models, and copy them. You'll learn how to do something, hopefully well, and if you do that, you'll eventually find your own way. You'll find your own style and your own contribution but learning from a master and just copying them is a pretty good formula for just about anything yeah because that seems like it transcends science you see that in art you see that in everything yeah is that, that that's a great way to learn and figure out your path I, I was gonna come back to the the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center so Obviously, there's a lot of things happening in here, but what's it moving towards? What's the, what, is, what are you all trying to accomplish here? Well, the grand vision is encapsulated in our mission, which is to improve the human condition through plant science. What that means is making scientific discoveries that can either in the short term, medium, or long term be applied to contribute to making food more nutritious, more affordable, uh, making our crops more productive, and very importantly, with a smaller environmental footprint. Because what we're aiming to do here is address this grand challenge of feeding a growing, changing world without over-consuming our natural resources like soil and fresh water. 
and doing it in a way that is um, that is available to all. It's one thing to be a very productive country in terms of agriculture. It's another thing to have kind of inequities around the world where not everyone has access to what we produce. And what our contribution there is to, to the best of our ability through collaboration and partnerships, deliver our science around the world where it's needed by some of the poorest people and some of the communities that are most underserved by science and technology. That's a big challenge. It's not the only thing we do, but it's a big part of what we do. So what are some of the things that are preventing or, you know, what are some of the challenges that you face as a leader of this organization in making that happen across the world? Well, uh, these are complicated issues that we're addressing. And so uh, getting the right partners, that's uh, always not necessarily a challenge in every case, but it's a really important contributor to success. Um, funding for scientific research on plants is not nearly as plentiful as funding for biomedical science. So just getting the resources to do our work is always a challenge. And a good part of that comes from donors and philanthropy that much of that is from right here in St. Louis. We also get grants from the federal government, but you know, like a lot of things from the federal government, that, right? that's, yeah. you know, there are challenges there that we work hard on. Um, taking a scientific discovery and ultimately bringing it into the marketplace that can happen in two modes. We work in two different ways. We work in a philanthropic mode with underserved regions, developing countries, for example. We have a number of projects involving Uganda, Nigeria, Kenya, for example. But the other route that I think your listeners are probably more comfortable with is through, through market-driven mechanisms. So we're, we get very involved in the startup community here in St. Louis, in particular in the 39 North District, where it's concentrated in food technology, agricultural technology, environmental technology, um, things that might sound like alternatives to conventional agriculture. That's growing part of 39 North as well. So we're very involved in that community. And in fact, some of the companies that are around the Danforth Center started here in the Danforth Center and were spun out. That's great. So I, I'm curious, just from hearing you talk about some of this stuff, you, you're talking about collaboration. And uh, I'm sure part of, part of what you do is trying to get a lot of different parties to collaborate and solve some very complex problems. But you're also talking about that idea of like, as a scientist, having that aha moment and being the only person that knows about this thing. Is there like a tension between trying to create environment of collaboration and and that whole other thing that you talked about? Yeah, no, I don't think so. I, you know, working in teams is an art. And uh, we don't necessarily train people in school and universities to be great collaborators. We tend to train people in disciplines and and people can kind of scoot by without paying much attention to math or engineers or physical chemists. But when you end up in a place like the Danforth Center, you really need to be working at some of those interfaces. Now, our scientists are not gonna become all types of scientists. Instead, we collaborate. So what comes out of bigger collaborations, ideally, is something bigger than you can do on your own. You hope it's more impactful. It requires, you know, a different set of skills. Communication becomes a very different game when you have to work with collaborators, 10 different collaborators at seven different institutions. Um, but I wouldn't say that discovery that happens in that environment is any less exciting than discovery that happens working on your own. The fact is, less and less and less science done these days is done by that one person working alone in the corner of a laboratory. That's, uh, you know, working toward extension. It's not quite there, but it's, it's a much 
less prevalent part of the scientific community these days. Yeah. Um, that's kind of the idea of the lone genius, which a lot of people say is, is it's a myth because a lot of the things that we we experience today aren't the work of one person. Exactly. The lone genius, if, if someone described, if you were looking for a job here and you described yourself, I'm a lone genius, we'd probably say, well, that's really interesting. <laughs> you know, good luck. Yeah. Because we're not actually looking for lone geniuses. We're not, we're not looking for geniuses, frankly. We're looking for people who understand what we're about, and that's learning things and then figuring out ways to make the world a better place with that learn with that with those with that new learning that new knowledge and so if you described yourself as kind of a lone wolf that doesn't really fit into the culture here and it's certainly not what we're looking for so tell me uh for the listening audience that's not in you know the field that of plant science or science in general what makes but they're interested in it. What makes a good scientist? Well, a good scientist has to be unsatisfied that they understand something well enough. So you always have to be asking, what's next? What's next? Okay, I figured this piece out. How does that fit into the bigger picture? Or let's say I figured out how, let's say I figured out what all the genes in a particular plant does. That would be great. No one's done that yet. That wouldn't be the end of the story. That would be the beginning of learning how a hundred species organize their genes. Because once you learn something, perhaps the scale of the problem can now be addressed at a, at a you know, it can expand. Or you go another layer deeper. You know, so a scientist who's good is never satisfied. This can irritate some people. Uh, I, I tell a story of a person in my lab many years ago who uh, had this wonderful discovery. And she was describing it to me. And I'm saying, this is fantastic. This lets us now do you know, X, Y, Z. And she was kind of depressed because I, I wasn't satisfied long enough on the, this great discovery that she made. I learned something else about that, and that's everyone's different, and everyone needs their own mentoring and their own uh, way of interacting with me. But that's another story. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, I'm curious about some of the discoveries or wh whatever you want to call them. Like, what kind of things have you seen come out of uh -huh. of here that are exciting? Yeah. Well, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, there are viruses that infect plants. A lot of people don't know this. A lot of people don't care, but they should because viruses in crops that we care about can lower yield or decimate a crop. That's the case, for example, with a food staple, a food security crop in Africa and some other parts of the world called cassava. We make tapioca pudding out of it. Um, if you go to a Nicaraguan restaurant down in South City, you can get some cassava. Okay. Um, but it's actually a staple crop or a major source of calories for almost a billion people around the world. But it's highly susceptible to viruses. And when these viruses get in, there's nothing you can do about it. You've lost the crop. So what can we do about it? Well, first of all, we can understand the virus. Second. We can help breed crops that are resistant to the virus. Uh, we can develop some therapeutic approaches to uh, immunize cassava against the viruses. There's a lot that we can do with science to address that problem. Just like if someone discovered a new virus in humans, there's a lot a virologist, a biomedical scientist could do to either minimize that as a, as a problem or you know, perhaps through immunization, perhaps through some other type of treatment. It's all science. Without the science though, you can't solve that problem. So that's an example. Um, another example is we're developing technology to be able to visualize what you can't see in plants. 
the underground portion. So the problem with studying roots is they're so hard to see. And you can yank a plant out, but roots that you see while you're holding them up, are, it, that's not, not quite as satisfying. So we've been developing some technology based on some biomedical imaging technology, x-rays, pet imaging, that allows us to see roots in their soil environment. And that now allows you to ask all kinds of questions. What are the microbes that normally live on and around the roots? What are they doing to promote growth? What happens uh, when we breed a drought-resistant crop? What's happening to the roots? Can we learn something there to use roots to breed a better crop? So those are just a couple of examples of where uh, there is a scientific approach to learning about plants and then an application or a real-world application of what you learn to make food either more affordable, nutritious, available, or to grow crops with a lower environmental footprint. So I know part of your mission, uh, the, the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center, is to establish this region, this area, as the epicenter for bioscience and agricultural innovation. So tell me, um, first of all, I've heard in my travels that this is the place to be for that. So you, that mission is actually being realized. That's right. Um, it's not the only place that wants to do this, but I think we're, we're on to something pretty good here. And we host a lot of visitors actually who want to emulate what we're doing. And we have a few competitors out there uh, who we compete for companies, for example. We would like companies to establish, you know, take up residence here, either startups or companies that are looking to move. We want them to move here. So the way it works is we've got this Danforth Plant Science Center, which is an intellectual hub. But a company that's right across the parking lot here in the bridge building or that's in the incubator just across from Bridge. And by the way, there's about 55 companies or so in that ecosystem. Um, a company can take advantage of what we have here. There's, we have open scientific seminars. Uh, they can come and talk to our scientists. We all have to respect intellectual property, uh, but they're very welcome to come over and learn what we're doing. And we hope to learn what they're doing. In some cases, that results in collaboration enabling the companies in the neighborhood to take advantage of the unique technology or the unique intellectual capabilities we have. Um, and in some cases, our scientists get involved in those companies, sometimes as advisors and sometimes as co-founders of those companies. So we have a couple of really good examples of that, one being Benson Hill Biosciences, uh, which is employing about 60 people in the region here um, they're, they're using what we can learn about photosynthesis and using um, artificial intelligence to breed crops better and faster. So it's an exciting company. But they started right here in this ecosystem taking advantage of what we had to offer. There's also services that they can purchase from the Danforth Center like like uh, greenhouse space or plant growth chamber space. They can grow plants without having to build a greenhouse and that's a great advantage obviously for a startup. So um, what's the makeup of uh, St. Louis versus like other, you know, where the companies come from that are currently here and w what is the process for recruiting or, you know, what's that message that we need to get out to the rest of the country and the world yeah. like that this is the place to be? Well, there's three uh, origins. You can break it down in three, uh, three buckets. There's the homegrown, the startup community, and that's growing every year. <clears throat> there's companies that have been located somewhere else in the U.S. and they're looking for a better home, one that has those amenities and those features I just described. And then there's the international companies uh, that are looking to establish a presence in the U.S. or in North America. 
Now, there's a number of ways that we facilitate the startup community here in St. Louis and recruit. At the international level, we work very closely with BioSTL, which is uh, very active in the international, national and international space recruiting companies. They have a, 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 a project called Global STL that focuses in a couple of geographies around the world, Israel, for example, and they put the legwork in to go visit these countries, visit the companies, uh, and letting them know what's here, letting them know what's in it for them if they locate the, an operation here. That's been very successful. So there's a range of things. We don't do it on our own. We are a part of a broader community helping to facilitate and to recruit companies. Um, uh, but there's a lot of activity in town and a lot of collaboration to do exactly that. And it's a competitive advantage, frankly. You go to most other communities, uh, you do not have that kind of regional coordination that is looking to develop and recruit companies nationally and internationally. And then once they're here, uh, you've got you've to welcome them into the community and then expect that they're going to contribute to what's developing here. And as is not surprising, companies that migrate to the area that are excited about being here want to contribute, and in fact, they do. And that's what makes this such an exciting region to be in this, in this ag tech space. Yeah. So somebody who wants to get in the ag tech space, go into research, you know, anything covering these things we've talked about, do you have any advice for, for those people? Well, uh, you know, have a good idea. Good ideas are, are really important. Um, have a good team. It's not just about the science and the idea. It's about do you have a team that investors can trust to actually do something? Um, you really ought to conceptualize a product really early. There's the temptation in a research environment like this to think that you can form a company that just does research. Well, that's a real tough go because there's not that many people that want to pay for that. People want a product that they can bring to market. So even if you're doing some pretty fundamental sounding research and you are really wanting to start a company, you better have a product that you can show a path to get to relatively quickly. You know, I haven't given you any advice that isn't pretty generic for someone who would want to start up a company. So tell us how people can get in. First of all, how can they uh, get in touch with the center and with the surrounding community? Like what's the, what's the process to start that application or start that uh, interest period? And then how can they get in touch with you online? Yeah. Well, uh, there are lots of ways that you can touch base with the Danforth Center. Number one, come to Venture Cafe. This is uh, happening once a month here at the Danforth Center. It happens once a week in Cortex uh, in Midtown, but it's a once a month event here at the Danforth Center. It's networking, it's uh, learning what the innovation community is doing. We have speakers at all the Venture Cafes. You know the routine. Um, you can connect with the Danforth Center by attending events. We do a lot of public events, usually evening events. We'll bring speakers or a panel of speakers in, usually addressing some kind of uh, uh, innovation meets a need, meets making the world a better place. That's the space we like to live in. Um, you can go to our website, which is um, www.danforthcenter.org. Uh, you can find us on Twitter. Um, just type in Danforth Center. Um, you can find me. I don't have a personal Twitter. I've avoided that, but if you want to learn, especially what my grandkids look like, you can find me on Facebook. <laughs> well, Jim, it's been a pleasure talking with you. I appreciate uh, I, you coming. I think we could probably talk for, for hours on these subjects, but... Thank you for your time. Well, I appreciate you guys coming. For more episodes, visit innovationcity.co. 
be sure to subscribe, rate, and review. If you're in St. Louis, visit us on a Thursday night. You can find details at vincafstl.org. You can also connect with us on social at We Are Slam or at Venture Cafe STL. This is where it all begins.